Hi, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this afternoon, we shall be talking briefly about Obama's lecture to Black people about voting for Kamala Harris for the Democratic Party. We know that Kamala Harris is the Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States. And she is deemed to be a Black woman and also a South Asian woman. But this concept of Kamala being Black is creating a lot of division in America, and particularly among Black males who seem not to be buying that Kamala is Black, or they're not buying it that she is going to be the savior of Black Americans. So we have that many Black men are refusing to vote for Kamala Harris as they do not see her having any vision or sharing any vision with the community of community about how she is going to solve the black challenges the, the challenges of the black community so we have her there and she's desperate as it seems it appears now that kamala harris is desperate for the votes of black males so what she has done she has enlisted Barack hussein obama former president of the united states are we yeah well, she has actually, I'm sorry, there was some technical difficulty. She has enlisted the support of Barack Hussein Obama, former president of the United States, to convince Black men that they ought to vote for her. We know that Barack Hussein Obama was a very eloquent, articulate, and someone who is well-respected in the Black community and also in the United States and globally. So what better person to enlist to woo black men to the to the Kamala Harris campaign team. However, it seems to me that black men are not buying it. And I think that it has compounded Barack Obama's speech or his lecture to black males has actually compounded the problem. Now, why is Barack Hussein Obama? Why does he have to woo black Americans at this juncture of the history? Are Black males tired of the Democratic Party? Are they looking for a better leader? Do Black males think that Black females or females in general have the wherewithal, the ability, the capacity to lead a nation that is in crisis? And we must understand that the United States is now in a crisis in all spheres of its life. And I'm sure Black men are wondering or people, men in general, are wondering, can a woman lead? Now, we know that the Democratic Party has this sort of ideology, this political ideology, that we're all equal, um, men and women, and men can do what women do, and women can do what men do. But is that true? And are Black males and men in general, are they buying that sort of ideology? Or do they understand that there is a role carved out for males? Um, and there are roles uh, carved out for females in our society. These are some of the questions that we need to ask because it is something that is, you know, creating a lot of divisions um, in the political realm, right, in the political world and in the West, not only in the United States, but we're speaking specifically about the United States in this podcast. Now, we, you know, one of the things that Barack Obama has to understand is that he was, of course, described also as a Black president. But when he went, you know, into the office of the presidency, into the Oval Office, he decided that he was not a Black president, even though he campaigned on such that he was going to be the first Black president of the United States of America, and he won. And the Black males and Black people in general were very instrumental in his going to the Oval Office, to the White House. But it seems to me that every time politicians, because that their, their, their main quest is to deceive, you know, that's what politicians do. They lie and they deceive, and they will make a lot of promises which they know that they cannot fulfill. Right. So we have that Barack Obama pretended as if he were black and, you know, and understood all the plight of black Americans. And he was able to articulate very well the history of black Americans in the American society. And, you know, he was able to talk and walk with the with black entertainers as he's doing now, showcasing his blackness. Right. And the fact that he is this cool guy that 
the typical working Black American can identify with. The problem we're facing in the American society and Americans have to come to grips with is race an objective understanding of who people are. When you say you're white or you're black or you're Asian, as it were, what does that really mean, right? And can you box people, can you put people into a box and say that this is who they are because of the pigmentation of their skin? I mean, does that really, really play, you know, how does that play out in our modern society in 2024? I mean, shouldn't we have grown up by this time to understand that pigmentation does not define who a person is? And that is why we have persons like the Martin Luther King Jr. who was saying that he was envisioning America in which people are not judged based on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And that does not just have to do with the black people. It has to do with any person whether you're Asian or you are European or you're African, right? We all understand that we should judge a person based on the color, not on the color of their skin, I should say, but on the content of their character, right? That's what we should, that's how a person should be judged. Am I correct? Now, if we are going to also agree with that statement, which I'm sure a lot of black people did and perhaps people who are progressive, yeah, say so that's a very reasonable statement, a very reasonable utterance by the former Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The problem is, so I would like to extend that sort of pronouncement, that declaration by Dr. King. And the fact is that we should also not judge or vote for a political candidate based on the pigmentation of their skin, but based on the color of their skin. We should also elect them or vote for them, or him or her rather, based on the policies that they have presented to us. And so far, we see where since the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in the United States that Black Americans, for the most part, we're not saying all of them, because the Black community, as is defined by people, is a diverse community just like any other community. Let me repeat that. The Black community in the United States is as diverse as any other community in the United States. And there is no Black community, I should say. Right? There's no black community. You have a number of people who share the same pigmentation, but they are all not alike culturally, religiously, economically, socially. They're not all alike. And we can look at, for, for example, black Americans who are of Caribbean descent, black Americans who are of African descent, black Americans who are of Latino descent, what you call Hispanic descent. Right, And the list goes on. Right, we could say Black Americans who are of European descent, who might have been born in countries like Germany, in the United Kingdom, right? And they are so-called Black, or they would be defined as being Black based on the pigmentation of their, their skin, but culturally are not African-Americans, right? So the Black community, but they might have, of course, been naturalized as American and perhaps are going to vote, you know, more than likely will vote. So it does not mean, therefore, because you are Black, it means that you are going through the same experience. Educationally, you have different class in terms of that. You have those who are more educated, those who are more sophisticated in the Black community, those who are more enlightened, right? Those of, who are, those of us who are religious. There are some people who are more religious than some. Dr. King was a religious man. He was a pastor, right? And we must say that in former times, the Black community was much more religious than it is now because people tend when they are facing very challenging circumstances, that's the time that they call on God. When they are, things are fairly going well and they don't have to, they're not facing any challenging circumstances, circumstances that are beyond their power to solve. They don't remember God. So for the most part, we must say that the Black community has forgotten their God, just like the Jews did when after they came out of Israel, out of that land of slavery. And we came out of that land of slavery. And you should see after slavery and the Black people were on the streets during after, you know, when, uh, what's his name? Abraham Lincoln proclaimed that, you know, act of emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation, after he proclaimed those sentences and Black people knew they were free, they also sang the song of Moses and the Lamb, the song of freedom 
right? That is what they went on the streets and they sang because they understood that they were coming from a very terrible, horrific experience of slavery. Now, Black people went through Jim Crow and they moved on to again to, to the modern civil rights where, you know, many times Black people were denied basic rights in a society in which they were born, in a society in which they were citizens, but they were denied some basic human rights. Now, we must understand also that, that the Democratic Party was the party of slavery, was that party that ensured that slavery and Jim Crow, the Jim Crow laws were enacted and that they were enforced. Now, how is it that Black Americans now have decided that they were going to join the Democratic Party because they were once Republicans, because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, right? He was known to be almost like the father of the Republican Party. He was not the father, but he, because of his prominence and the fact that he is one of, if not the greatest American president, then he's also linked with that part, the party of, then the party of freedom. It's now more aligned, perceived as it were. It's not so now because since Trump entered the race in 2016, there is a political shift. But we shall not, let's not go ahead of what we're trying to say here. But the fact of the matter is that the, the Democratic Party is the party, or was the party, I should say, of Jim Crow, the, 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 the Dick of the Dixocrats, right? Those who believed in segregation, who did not believe in upward, in black upward so, social mobility and who sought as much as possible to keep Black people in destitution and in poverty. Now, we understand that the Democratic Party, because it wanted power, it wanted to wanted votes, you know, when during the time of the civil rights, you know, and um, that they sort of acted as if they cared about Black people, but they didn't really, they were just doing it for votes and also what was happening in on the global scene where people, you know, in other countries, were very, very astonished to see that Americans were actually treating their own citizens in the way that they were treating the way which, in which they were being treated during the Cold War, and yet America was going abroad and saying that it's spreading freedom and democracy. So the, the whole foreign policy, people saw a lot of contradictions, a lot of hypocrisies, and the United States was forced, as it were, to grant Black people civil rights in the 1960s, not because it wanted to do so, but because it was compelled to do so based on the global crisis, based on the Cold War, and the fact that people were not seeing it as a viable option to the Soviet Union. So the United States pretended as if it cared about its Black people and decided to give them civil rights. Fast forward to that, we see that in the 1990s under the, the, um, the Clinton administration and the same Biden, you know, he, uh, you know, actually crafted a law, the Crime Bills Act that saw, you know, witnessed the incarceration of many black men. Because I think that the United States understood that black males are a threat based on the civil war because the civil rights, well, we can see the civil war too and the civil rights move, act movement, the civil rights movement rather, the, the, the prominent role that black men play or have played in those two very important revolutionary movements in the United States. You know, I, under, I understand, or if you read the history, you see that, you know, for the European people, you're, you're American, they would understand that black males or a threat because when they decide to mobilize themselves and to mobilize the so-called black community, that things get done because they have a strong and the influential disposition. When we think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when we think about Malcolm X's and the Marcus Garvey's and the, the litany, right? The litany of very firm, solid, Black males that we don't have anymore. It seems that we have lost them or they have been suppressed. We might have a few, but their voices are not heard because what we have today are people like the Barack Hussein Obamas who really are have been bought and sold, right, by these very wealthy um, aristocrats and also oligarchs. So we know that Barack Hussein Obama by now, he was sent by Wall Street to protect the economic interest of these economic 
bureaucrats, these economic elites. And so he did. And that's why he was not about implementing any progressive policies to, to improve the lives of the Black community. Now, we must say that Black males are not asking American politicians to give them things, to give them handouts. What they're asking for are policies for the American politicians, the government to craft policies that will and that are more equitable. And that will give them some amount of, um, what should I say, no, freedom to live comfortably, peacefully in the American society, just like any other community. But America, the, the American policies, the American political policies have not always been and have never been, you know, should I say amenable to black interest. They have always been antagonistic, particularly to black men, because they understand that males represent systems of leadership right and if you weaken the structure of a man then you're going to weaken the home you are weakening that system of leadership and that is what we're seeing now there is a void there is a dearth of male leadership in what is termed as the black community so we have the, the because there's a vacuum there's a void people like Barack Hussein Obama's and the entertainers and Dr. Hussein Obama is also an entertainer, right? He's a politician, but he's also an entertainer because he entertains you by telling you what you need to do and pretending also as if he's a pastor and lecturing you and telling you that you have to do this because it is your religious obligation to vote for a woman because she is black. What does that mean? As I suggested, we should be voting based on the person's policy, based on the politician's policies and not based on the pigmentation of her or his skin. Because we have already seen a Black president, and we understand that Barack Hussein Obama said that he was not there to defend the interest of Black people. He was there as an American president, and he was working for the military-industrial complex. Right? He was a proud worker for that industry, and not for the American people at large, specifically Black people. Right. But so this is what Obama is here saying that black people should vote for Kamala because she's black and because she's a woman. And what is that nonsense? Have we ever heard such nonsense in terms of the utterances of Barack Hussein Obama? Now, listen to what Hussein Obama, Barack Hussein Obama is saying. You're coming up. Let me get this. Sorry. You're coming up with all the kinds of reasons and excuses. Obama said about soft support for Vice President Kamala Harris among some Black men. And he continues, I've got a problem with that because part of it makes me think, and I'm speaking to men directly, part of it makes me think that, well, you just don't, you just aren't feeling the idea of having a woman as president and you're coming up with other alternatives and other reasons for that. So here, Barack Hussein Obama, the president, the former president of the United States, is suggesting that the reasons for which, and that could be a part of the problem, the reasons for which, or the main reason, I should say, for which Black males are not supporting Kamala Harris as the future president of the United States or on her ticket for becoming the future president of the United States is that they do not support the idea of having a female president. Maybe some are like that, but we cannot, again, generalize right that the entire community of men because they have the same they have the same pigmentation that and black people also are diverse in terms of even the pigmentation not, not all black people or people who are considered to be black people in america share the same pigmentation that's also another thing we are diverse in every aspect so what is this black community about Right? There is no real Black community, as they are suggesting. And Americans need to get rid of this race-based politics, this racial identity, this you know, identity politics that is destroying the very fabric of the political tradition, the political um, machine in the United States. It is. Very tight. Now the time is ripe for Americans to grow up 
and to understand that people are people. And it doesn't mean it, it, what should really matter is that culturally, Americans share a lot of the same values, right? As a nation, as a people, right? Why are you now focusing on who is black and who is yellow and who is white and who is purple? It does not make any sense. It is childish, it's infantile. And Americans need to grow up intellectually because it makes them look like children who are just constantly quarreling over who is black and you should be voting for that black president or Asian or the first South Asian. Doesn't make any sense. And that's why people are having this you know, controversy over Kamala's identity. Is she Indian? Is she Jamaican? Is she, they, they're confused because Jamaica is not a race. Being Indian is not a race also, right? These are two different nationalities. And on these two different nationalities, you have different ethnic groups that live there in these two countries, right? So Kamala's father could be a mixture and more than likely is a mixture of some of these ethni ethni ethnicities rather that live in these countries. It doesn't have to be that you, you're going to now say you know, unequivocally, that the man is black, right? And what's her name? There's uh, Kamala's mother. The Indian mother could also have been mixed in terms of the ethnic, different ethnic groups that live in, in India, right? But Americans are so much obsessed with this, these sort of racial identities, which really are childish. And it shows a lack of education, a lack of sophistication in the 21st century, right? But they will not grow up because they are so tethered to it. That is very difficult. They have been brainwashed and they have been, you know, <laughs> what, what should I say? Totally mesmerized by the concept of race, right? Race is a social construct. And in modern America, we can also say it's also a political construct because you are what you want to be, right? You are what you want to be. There are people who look white, what you deem to be white, who have black blood. And there are persons who are black as I am who also have white blood, right? Who have had a European ancestor, right? Because we are mixed in this in this continent, on this continent, we call the Americas. We are mixed because of the history of slavery and other things that happened during that time. When are we going to read and understand the history and that history informs what is happening at the present moment? We've got to wake up, we've got to grow up, we've got to mature, we've got to have more intelligent and more elevated conversations. And what we're seeing now with the Barack Hussein Obama forcing black males to vote for Kamala because she's black, she's a black woman. Uh, what does that mean? What are her policies? And Kamala Harris does not seem to have any substantive policies. She doesn't have it. She's bereft of anything that is substantive, right? I can't vote for somebody because that person is black or she's a woman. You've got to vote for someone because she is going to make a difference. She's going to be transformative, right? And she is going to ch change those things that need to be changed, right? But what we're seeing in the United States is that there are people like the Barack Hussein Obamas are forcing people to vote because somebody's, somebody's white or somebody's black. Now, what if a white man should go up and say to the white community, or a Jewish person should go and say to the Jewish community that they should vote for the person because the person is Jew. And you're gonna hear black Americans saying, oh, that person is racist, that person is racist. So we can say that Barack Hussein Obama is also a racist because why is he foisting up on black people? Does he think black males are inferior? Does he think that, that they lack some sort of sophistication not to be able to think for themselves and so vote accordingly? What is he trying to imply? What is he trying to suggest to the black community? Right? What is he doing? He and his wife are living comfortably well, 
in the United States. They are millionaires. They are multi-millionaires. Right? The latest you know, reports coming out of Washington is that Michelle Obama, she charges $750,000 for one speech. Right? For one speech in a society, in a country where many people, particularly people who are called Black people, are suffering and are finding it very difficult to eke out a basic um, life in the United States of America, in these United States of America, right? Yet Obama is behaving as if he understands the reality of Black people, which he really doesn't, right? Which he really doesn't. Now, it's very interesting that we are hearing from the Reuters, from Reuters, sorry, from Reuters newspaper, Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris will next meet Next week, she's going to meet next week um, to highlight her economic policies that benefit Black men, hoping to energize a voting bloc that some advisors fear has embraced Republican rival Donald Trump in large numbers, three sources familiar with the plans said. So it's interesting because Black males have decided that, they, well, they haven't shown their support for her. It's now forcing her to craft economic policies for Black males. But why didn't she think of that before all of this pressure on her to do it? Well, the pressure is on in the sense that they're not supporting her. So she feels pressured. She feels, she feels cornered. She feels that, you know, she needs to connect with them. And shouldn't they have been one of the first community or communities to have connected with? You know, recently she had a town hall meeting with the Latinos which suggests that the Black people are not important. But she needs their votes. So she's pandering to the base. And she's using Obama to do that for her because she cannot imbibe that sort of hope, that sort of conf confidence in the Black community because Kamala just, just, she doesn't have it. Kamala does not have it as a leader. And at this point where the United States is going through a crisis or through major crises, Kamala is not the best person for the presidency of the United States at this juncture of the history. She's not the best Black candidate, so-called, if you want me to speak the truth. And I think that Black males are perceiving that. She is not the best candidate for the presidency of the United States in terms of the money and the people who are backing her. Yeah, for them, but not for the ordinary Americans. She can be. Now, the Reuters continue to say the policy focus will coincide with an event in Detroit on Tuesday where Harris will be interviewed by popular Black radio personality Charlemagne Fagod, who has been critical of the Biden administration, the sources said. See, they're always sending people who are, should I say, you know, um, who support her campaign and who support her presidency. They're not going to send a Black leader or even a Black male who is articulate and who can ask her the hard questions. Right? So they're going to have something that is friendly and it looks like she is definitely a lover and someone who is willing to transform the Black community. Harris will discuss access to capital for Black entrepreneurs, ways to grow small businesses and housing solutions but will not touch on racial justice issues, the sources said. So she's not going to touch on racial justice issues because she knows she was a part of it in California and she has a disastrous record in California. The policies will borrow from her broad economic package aimed at lowering costs and boosting the middle class, they added. Now, I think the best thing, and you know, Cameron needs to understand that, and I think she knows that, the best thing to boost the middle class is to stop the, the wars that the United States is waging against countries in the Middle East and in the world at large. If these wars are stopped, right? If the military industrial complex is totally destroyed, right? Or significantly reduced, then I think that you can build the middle class, and she could help small businesses. But we also saw during the pandemic 
that the Democratic Party was one of those, part, the, the main party, I should say, who wanted a very long and lengthy lockdowns. And those lockdowns resulted or caused the destruction of many small businesses. Right? Of many small businesses businesses. And we don't want to have a debate on what should have been done because this platform will not allow me to articulate what should have been done. But the fact is that other measures could have been taken, but the Democratic Party was very, very, you know, um, strident. They were determined that the, the best thing for, you know, ridding the society of a disease, of a, a respiratory disease, was the lockdown. And the lockdown should last for a long time, which destroyed. And the policies surrounding the opening of some of these small businesses resulted also in the deaths of these businesses. And they will never be restarted. Right? So we don't know what they're talking about, about giving money to Black businesses to start up. That's nonsense. Where is the money coming from? if all of these wars are going to be still be waged and the United States is $32 trillion in debt. Where is that money coming from? But Black people, you've got to look at Kamala Harris's policies carefully. Look at her policies carefully. And we're not talking about Trump in this video. We're, we're talking about why you should or you should not vote for Kamala Harris, the Democratic Party. And first of all, we talk about Abortion is the seems to be her top priority. And it seems that it's going to be a policy driven goal for her presidency. Right. And that is what we have to understand. And I've, you know, I've just read this here from the policy report, the effects of abortion on the black community. And this is coming from actually the congress.gov. Right. And this was written in 2015. Now, Politicians argue for abortion larger because they do not want to spend the necessary money to feed, clothe, and educate more people. I repeat that. Politicians, and this is coming from Jesse Jackson. He was pro-life. He was then pro-life. So this is coming from Jesse Jackson, who is now perhaps, well, he's a very prominent face of the Democratic Party, right? But this is what Jesse Jackson, and we must say that people have their rights to evolve, right? We do evolve in terms of our understandings of the world and stuff like that. So you can't also knock him for that. But let's see what he's saying here in 1977. That's the then pro-life Jesse Jackson. Politicians argue, and let me share my screen with you because you might say, Wow, he's talking and we're not seeing he's actually making up these things, right? And I, you know I like to show my receipts. I'm boasting, you know, when it comes on to my receipts. I have to show you my receipts. Let me make the screen broader, bigger rather, so you can also see from whence I'm reading. So politicians are for abortion largely because they do not want to spend the necessary money to feed, clothe, and educate more people, right? Here arguments for inconvenience and economic savings take precedence over arguments for human value and human life. Psychiatrists, social workers, and doctors often argue for abortion on the basis that the child will grow up mentally and economically scared, or scarred, I should say, it's not scared, but scarred. But who of us is complete? If incompleteness were the criterion, or the criteria, for taking life, we would all be dead. I repeat that. If incompleteness were the criterion for taking life, we would all be dead. If you can justify abortion on the basis of emotional incompleteness, then your logic would also lead you to killing for other forms of incompleteness, blindness, crippleness, and old age. And he's right. We're not complete. And we know that we're living, we're living in a world that is sinful, a world that is inadequate, a world that is incomplete. And you'll never feel that sense of completion. You're going to feel, always have that sense of being incomplete, even if you're wealthy, even if you were born in a nuclear family. All right? So we can't just say you're going to abort a child because the child was, you know, because of the rape or whatever. And, and these things are traumatic. And don't get me wrong. 
Right? These things are traumatic, but we must understand that a life is precious in the sight of God. And life does not always come in the way in which we want it to come. Sometimes it is painful. Even going through our own lives, you might be going down the road, for example, and you got into an accident and one of your legs had to be amputated and you just have to deal with it. Are you going to kill yourself because you were walking with your two legs and you could have been mobile in the way you want to be mobile? No. And if you have to amputate your leg, your, your, one of your legs, it's not something that's going to be celebrated. It's not going to be, you know, a policy that is going to be implemented that those who have accidents should amputate their legs. Or if you have diabetes, you should amputate your leg because that is the way how to do it. That's not something you celebrate. You do it because, and you shamefully do it. Not that you should say you should shamefully do it, but you do it because it is required. It is necessary. But it's not something you're going to broadcast to the entire world. And it's almost like this abortion thing is becoming a situation in which women are now proud, have become proud advocates of murdering an unborn baby, on, on, of, on aliving as it were, though that baby might have come through very sorrowful means. We've got to be careful because we are not creators here. We are creatures, right? We are not creators of anything. Now, it's interesting here, The um, there was some statistics the stats that were given and I'm sort of, yeah, since the 1973, let me open up my, let me share my screen with you again because I just want to give you some little information here. Since the 1973 Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision, over 54 million babies have been aborted in centers around the world, right? And in the nation, around the nation, not the world, around the nation, not the world, around the nation. What am I saying? 54 million babies have been aborted in centers around the nation, the United States. 54 million and this has been since 1973 so this is almost like a war on the unborn right this is a war on the unborn think about world war ii and how many how many millions of people but that was a world war this is a national war right this is a national crisis it can be said with certainty that the practice has had a personal, practical, and political effect on communities and citizens. Every town, city, ethnicity, and age group has suffered from the tragic effects of the most surgical and sometimes medical procedure. The true toll of abortion may remain unknown and immeasurable because the data, for the most part, has not been collected or has been ignored by those responsible for its collection. Right? For those, so listen to these, the abortion consumer. Disproportionately, the leading consumer of the abortionist services is the African-American female, the Black female. According to the 2011 Abortion Surveillance Report, issued by the Center for Disease Control, Black women make up 14% of the childbearing population, yet obtained 36.2% of reported abortions. Black women have the highest abortion ratio in the country with 474 abortions per 1,000 live births. Percentages at these level or levels illustrate that more than 19 million Black babies have been aborted since 1973. 19 million. 19 million. Right? 19 million babies have been aborted. Now, let's go over now to the family, the nuclear family. We know that the Democratic Party also is supports same-sex marriages, right? And the transgendered agenda, they support that. So wholesome family values are outside the door, traditional fam family values. And we know that the Black community is facing a crisis in the family. We understand that the fathers are not in the homes. Many of them are in prison. The homes are largely run by females. And I'm wondering if 
black men are looking at that too, in which they are seeing that the, the homes, the black family homes, the black family and, the, and, the, and their living conditions have been so, the values have been eroded. And they're seeing that many, particularly their sons are not brought up in the way that they would like to see their sons being brought up because the black males are not in the homes. And we know that the policies in the 1990s of the Clinton administration was to take the black male out of the home and have the home run by females. And we see successive generations where black males continue to go to prison, right? And they are among the most incarcerated, if not the most incarcerated in the, the American prison system. Right? And this, it, these are policies supported by the Democratic Party, a party that we say is less racist, less pro-business. But is it? Is the Democratic Party less pro-business? Is it also, or is it shifting? Is it going back? Is it regressing to the party of the Dixocrats, of the segregationists? But it's using these four progressive policies as it is purporting itself to be, these four cultural wars to cement its, or to solidify, I should say, its prominence and to pretend as if it is progressive and it is pro-Black people when it is not, right? It is not pro-Black people. The party of war, we see where the, the Democratic Party under Barack Obama has shifted, moved to becoming a party of war, who engenders war. I told you on this podcast that, you know, what's his name, uh, Joe Biden, could not have settled down in the White House before he started a war with Russia in the Ukraine. And we know reports are coming out that they could have brokered out a peace deal with Putin. America could have done it, but America refused to do it. Biden refused to do to eat to ink out to broker that peace agreement with the Russians because he understands that the United States is on that quest for full spectrum dominance. And in order to do that, you have to, you know, induce wars. You you've got to start up wars. You have to be a war machine. Because people are not going to allow you to just come into their, their countries and control without fighting. Right? They are going to fight. They're going to fight for the resources. They're going to fight for their cultural habits and their norms and their mores. Right? But the United States wants to eclipse. Hmm? So this is the Kamala Harris. This is the sort of party that Kamala Harris is vying for the presidency. This is what she is going to do. These are some of the policies. And are you in agreement with those policies? Right? And we're not suggesting here that women should not have the freedom to do, you know, or men or whoever, citizens in general. And remember now that when we say the woman has the right, it's her body. Remember now that it takes two to tango and you have a male in that. Males also have a right to decide whether or not, because without him, she wouldn't be able to be pregnant anyway. So both should have or should make that decision whether an abortion should be had. I'm not for abortion, but I'm saying that if it is that it merits and is justified, then let it be. But it can't be that it's only the woman, right, who makes that decision. Yeah, it's, there's no male support. Maybe she has to. But if both of them are living together, can't be that the woman just gets up because she doesn't want a child. Then she goes and she aborts it. So what world are we living in? So because I don't want a nose, well, <laughs> I just well I can't live without a nose, right? But I say an heir, right? If I don't want one of my heirs, I just go and take it off. And I think we're coming to that society because we are so crude as a populace right now, as a global populace. People are crude and they're stupid. They're unwise. So let's look clearly at what this Democratic Party is about, because maybe my video is very long right now, uh, but this was this guy here, Harry Belafonte, had some very insightful things to say about the Democratic Party. 
and let's listen to him, shall we? This is, let, let's go for a moment and see if we can start here. Let me share my screen with you and let's see what he is saying about the Democratic Party and America's politics in general, political landscape. What is going on here? Let me close this. Sisters, uh, isn't it until it touches certain aspects of white America, that white America all of a sudden wakes up to the fact that uh, there's something called the Klan and it does its mischief. Uh, what causes me to have great thought Something that's most unique to my experience, and as I said earlier tonight, uh, at the doorstep of being 90 years of age, I had thought I'd seen it all and done it all, only to find out that at 89, I knew nothing. But uh, the most peculiar thing to me has been the absence, the Black presence in the middle of this resistance, not just the skirmishes that we've seen in Ferguson and uh, Black Lives Matter. And I think those protests and those voices being raised are extremely important. Let me go to, let me move over to shift over to this part where he was talking about, you know, black people in politics in general, particularly the Democratic Party. All right, so let me see if we go here. They had to become heads of corporations. They became players in the game. All right, so he's talking about black, yeah. So he's about to talk about black people and their evolution in the American political uh, system and uh, began to become big time players and began to become heads of corporations. Oh, oh did I, sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, let me go back to give you some sort of context, okay? Yeah, let me see if I could stop. You've lost, you will forever be distracted with possessions and trinkets and title. And I think one of the big things that happened was that when Black people began to be anointed by the trinkets of this capitalist society and uh, began to become big time players and began to become heads of corporations. They became players in the game of our own demise. The heart was to find in a space for rebellion. Uh, so, my own feelings and thoughts because I was one of the voices that was raised in recruiting those young students to participate in our rebellion. David, my hands are spread. Okay, so we are seeing here where um, Harry Belafonte has intimated that because the black people have been trapped by the economic um you know trappings i should say of the american capitalist system in which they become heads of corporations they have been also set up to be some of the exploiters some of black americans greatest exploiters call them uncle tom if you will you know so and it's not only in the Republican Party, it is on both sides of the political aisle. And we know now that the Democratic Party is the party of big money. There are two segments of the Republican Party. We have the Trumpian Republican Party, and we also have the establishment Republican Party. And we see where there is a division now when the establishment of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party wing, has moved over to the Democratic Party, which many are, you know, comprised of neocons, because the neocons are the ones who, for the most part, are the engineers of this war machine that the United States 
um is uh, currently you know is 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 um has built right the neocons are the ones who have who have built this war machine called the United States of America so we've got to really delve into our history we've got to put things into proper context and realize that the Democratic Party is not the party of black people at this juncture of the history. Right? It is not the party of black people. It's not their party of Americans. It's a party of war. It's a war machine just like the Republican Party is, but it's even so more. It has morphed into this behemoth of a war machine that I don't think that it will ever regress, it would ever come back to the days of FDR, right? To the days of the New Deal Democratic Party. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you would like and you share and you subscribe. Remember now that you have to like the videos so the videos can be shared on the platforms. See you in another video. All the best to you. Bye.